Lauren Schuler Donner once sat as you are now in the comm commencement waiting to be handed her degree in film and television. In the years since then, she's become maybe not a superhero like you've seen, but certainly a super producer. She has her own star on the Hollywood work, Walk of Fame. Her films, listen to this, have earned $5 billion in the box office, B. That's billion with a B. And more than that, she has directly helped many lives with her philanthropy, especially in funding cancer treatments. She met the challenge that Horace Mann had put out about achieving a victory for humankind, and I'm confident she's going to achieve many more. It's an honor for me to introduce Ms. Lauren Schuler Donner, class of 1971. Thank you, Dean. President Brown, Dean Fiedler, distinguished faculty, members of the board, proud parents, guests, welcome. Class of 2019, congratulations, guys. You did it. Give yourselves a hand, graduate. I am thrilled to be here today. Never in my life did I imagine I would receive an honorary doctorate, as I will in a few days, nor did I think I would be asked to give a commencement speech at Calm. I'm honored, I'm moved, and in truth, amazed. You see, despite being a proud alum of this university, this is my first experience at a BU commencement. I graduated from Calm, but I did not attend my own commencement in 1971. It was, in 1971, it was a time of political and social unrest, of dissent, of U.S. drafted troops, my male peers, friends, fighting a needless, unwinnable war in Vietnam. Sorry, this is not catching up here. Okay, um, I was a radical, I was a hippie and I was too anti-establishment to attend an institutional ceremony such as this. So, it's with ironic pleasure that I now wear BU's cap and gown today, and I note how life changes. I loved my two years at Calm. I loved taking film classes. I remember carrying a 16 millimeter Bull U camera and walking along the BU bridge and filming and just imagining myself this budding director. I loved editing my films down in the basement of Calm until bleary eyed, I begrudgingly had to give up the Avid to another student. I loved making my own small hand-drawn animated film. And I loved acting in my friend's movies because it taught me early on which side of the camera I belonged. <laughs> I hope you did the same, because that's what Calm is for. Not only to, to learn, but also to be as creative as you can. And through that process, maybe you found what you were really good at, where you excelled. That may be what you will do in your future, and you need to pay attention to it. I always loved reading, and I loved story. And in fact, being good at story and script carried into being strong at editing and casting, and that has guided my career. Sometimes I still can't believe that I'm paid to tell stories. I love producing. The camaraderie, the love-hate relationship with the business, and having an idea and then seeing it work on screen. When I watch audiences laugh at our film's jokes, when the audience weeps at the moment of our character's goodbye, and when the audience fans out of the theater happy to have been moved at something I had a part in creating, I feel a satisfaction like no other. It's a powerful gratification. It's a powerful aphrodisiac. And it all started right here at Calm. So, look, you may not know what you want in life right now, but that's all right, because the ride to your future will take you places 
and will find detours that you can't possibly imagine right now. Boston University was that for me. It changed my life in really profound ways. So let me explain. I was never a great student, okay? It wasn't that I wasn't curious or didn't have the mental capacity. I was rebellious. Probably like a lot of you, I don't like to do what I don't like to do. I never have, I never will. And therefore, my grades in high school reflected this. In English and history, where the power of language and storytelling were at the core, I thrived. In math and sciences, with the very practical demands of theoretical study, let's just say I was challenged. I was too social, I was too distracted by what interested me, and I was too busy doing that to apply myself. I was accused of being a dreamer. Teachers would say to my parents, if only Lauren would get her head out of the clouds, she might do great things. Well, consequently, I didn't have the required grades to get into the College of Liberal Arts. So instead, BU recommended that I attend the College of Basic Studies, now known as the College of General Studies, CGS. All right. Where people with the potential to succeed, like us, could. And at CGS, I found a population of students like myself, average grades, loaded with promise, and ready for sparks that would ignite our interests. And sure enough, I thrived. I found outstanding courses that appealed to my wonder, taught in ways that were unique and engaging. I found success, and I learned a lesson that should have been intrinsic, and that is, I was good at what I loved. So, my high marks at CGS then allowed me to graduate and transfer to one of BU's colleges. One day, during my last year at CGS, while crossing the MTA tracks and dreaming about who knows what, something or another, I looked down this long expanse of railway and I saw, at that time it was called the School of Public Communications, now, of course, College of Communications. And I don't know, perhaps the tracks were a metaphor for the future or the promise of the next turn or the fact that I had been actually encouraged to dream and to think about how to apply those dreams. But literally right then and there, I subconsciously put it all together and I decided that I wanted to go to that school to pursue my love of writing and photography and storytelling. I was going to make movies. Now, looking at my career over the subsequent decades, you might think that made perfect sense. But growing up in the 1950s and 60s in a suburb of Cleveland, Ohio, nobody actually thought about making movies or television. Nobody thought about going to college to learn how to make movies or television. I was barely aware there was a film industry. Still, for the very first time in my life, I felt like I had found the right path, so I transferred to Calm and I flourished. My quickness to learn buoyed my confidence. I had found what I loved, and I was good at what I loved. I had found my purpose. So, after graduating Calm, I did everything I could to get a job that had anything to do with putting great stories up on the screen. Now, there weren't very many women looking for jobs at, the, at that time. These were not inclusive years, and it was very difficult, it was very hurtful. Many men did not want a woman or any minority behind a camera or producing. So it took a while, but I learned a valuable lesson. I learned that their problem with me, being a female, looking for equality in the movie business, was just that their problem. So I started out editing medical and educational films. Now, this wasn't anybody's idea of, you know, the movie business, but I'd accomplished that vital first step, which is I had got my foot in the door and someone was actually paying me a salary to learn how movies were made. Through a series of jobs, I then navigated the world, often being the only girl in a boy's treehouse. 
Although this was the early 70s, and this was the wave, the first wave of modern feminism, where believe it or not, one of the most popular songs of the era had a line that said, I am woman, hear me roar. But the train had just started rolling, and it hadn't gathered steam yet. And for me, it was a challenging journey. The upside was this. I developed thick skin, and I honed my strengths to learn quickly. Now, I want to offer you guys some advice for finding work. I'm going to do it throughout the morning. Biggest piece of advice, do not take rejection personally. Or as they said in The Godfather, it's not personal, Sonny. It's strictly business. You're going to hear a lot of thanks, I'll get back to you, and then nothing. You will need perseverance to keep on looking. You're going to have to keep at it. Okay, you're going to have to believe in yourself. And if you do, I guarantee you something will happen. A door will open. Okay, so I worked my way up the ladder. And in the beginning, in quick succession, I was a camera woman in television, an associate producer in television, an associate producer on a movie. And then finally, at the young age of 27, I produced a movie for television. It was very well received, but moreover, I was on my way, and I was doing what I loved. So I hope any of you who find any doors locked before you defy expectations and kick those doors open with a loud bang. So, yes. From that first film 41 years ago to right now, I've produced about 30, 35 movies, uh, executive produced a handful of movies, executive produced two TV series, and I'm now in the process of taking two of my movies and turning them into theater projects headed for Broadway, Dave and The Secret Life of Bees. So all that hard work and heartache and passion and joy began right here the day I crossed the MTA tracks and decided to go to Calm. Now, I'm proud of having navigated all that in Hollywood without losing my integrity or my soul. Too many people in my business and in any business have found success by stepping on others. Whatever you do in your life, maintain your good character. Leave this campus and follow your moral compass. If you do, your success will be more valuable in the long run, right? There's a lot of temptation out there to cheat and to step on others, to steal projects and not give credit. But really, it is just as easy to give credit to others, and it doesn't take anything away from you. Honestly, it is just as effortless to lend a hand and to do the right thing. You will be respected for it, and you will respect yourself more, and you will sleep better. Early on, a studio veteran allowed me to produce my first movie, that TV movie. He did it, he said, to pay back the man who gave him a break. So I, in turn, have opened the door for many others to pay back both those gentlemen. Now, while I was busy making plan other plans, life had a few dark twists in the road that I didn't see coming. I've suffered some medical problems. I've had uh, kidney disease and lupus, and I've twice battled cancer. After many bouts of chemotherapy, where the demands of my illness were challenged by the demands of my work, I came to understand that the relationships I have with the people I love are often more powerful than the relationship I have with my work. It is often the, uh, often the case, the deeper understanding of contentment takes time. I've had the great fortune of being successful, right? It has been amazing. It's opened many, many doors, but I've paid for it. Work was my life. Powering through multiple movies, often at the same time, was brutal. It was all consuming, it was, but it was enthralling. I got high off it. But after all these years, I've come to realize that the true meaning of contentment really comes from finding balance in life. And for me, that was the power of love. I found the power in love in having family. 
I didn't have children, but my sister Barbara did, and she generously shared her two daughters with me to the point we all call me Mom Two. It was good for my extraordinary nieces, Courtney and Hillary, and it was good for me. I taught them how to ride bikes, drive cars, and navigate through difficult times. They, in turn, have shared their abiding love, my beloved almost daughters, and they have provided a continuing legacy of love in my two amazing grandnephews, Tyler and Ryan, who are like my grandsons. So when asked if I have children, I answer no, but I have family, I have love. I have seen the power of love in friendships. Nothing makes life sweeter than good friendships. There's nothing like a good friend that you can confide in and, and be yourself with and share your ups and downs and help you with your commencement speech. Thank you, Shelley. <laughs> You'll have made a few good friends during your four years here. So make an effort to keep those relationships, guys. Friendship is often the equal of family. I have seen the power of love as a board member and a volunteer at Holly Grove, which was a group home for abandoned and abused children from ages 6 to 12. The stories within each child were horrific. The deprivation of love caused by their parents' abuse and neglect left them feeling unlovable. But the care that they would receive, these children, the bonding, and the love that was maintained in a consistent and safe environment slowly opened their hearts and, and allowed some of them to trust. Now, seeing that curative power of love at Holly Grove had a profound effect on me. And I've seen the power of love in a partner. When I was 33 years old, divorced, and a wild, obsessed young movie producer, I fell in love with a man who became my husband and is the true secret of my success. He loved me and he helped me through the worst of it. The desperate health scares, the backbiting occasional reality of the film business, the fear you're not as good as they think you are, the fear of failure. And he loved me through the best of it, raising our dogs, celebrating a hit, nurturing our marriage, traveling through life. And he was rewarded me with a love so strong that even my worst insecurities couldn't fight him off. I am who I am today because Richard Donner has guided me, made me laugh, and loved me through it all. And I am thankful to him every day. I understand that what is valuable in life is to love and to love as deeply as you can without getting in your own way. All right, guys, now it's the moment for your next movie to begin and for your life story to be written. Soon you're gonna go out into the, into the workforce. You may, you, I'm sorry, you are at this point in your life the target audience that TV, movies, games, publicity, social media, and all kinds of printed word want to reach. Now, since no one knows anything in content, you have the advantage, right? You can walk in that door and say, I know, I am the demographic, okay? By the time a person has ascended to the position, that they can decide on content, they often have lost touch with their audience. You shiny new graduates have another advantage. You have not learned to conform to a system's structure. Sometimes we learn something that we're taught or the way we think we should do it, and then we forget to unlearn. But the truth is, is that sometimes our systems are broken and they're old. You are right now free to think outside the box especially if you don't know what the box is. You are free to be disruptors, so do disrupt this system. It is harder to categorize who you are, the, I'm sorry, the harder it is to categorize who you are, the more you will stand out. When I went out to look for work in, in the beginning in Los Angeles, I didn't realize how truly unusual I was as a woman trying to break in to be a producer. 
I had blinders on. Not that I didn't have insane opposition, trust me, I did. But I truly didn't see at the time how radical I was, which I think probably helped me move forward because I thought outside the box without really understanding the box. And I didn't understand how disruptive it was. One of the best things I can I learned that I can share with you now was to always to go, go into any meeting or any interview knowing what you want. Have an agenda that you want to accomplish. Washington Irving said, great minds have purposes, others have wishes. In your meetings, try to be calm, and if you're not feeling confident, pretend you are. Fake it till you make it. I did. Okay? I used to give myself pep talks right before each important meeting. Confidence is very, very attractive. But confidence is like any other skill. It's a muscle that can be strengthened by constant practice. Stand up straight, put your head up high, take a deep breath, and stay composed. It worked for me. It's working right now. <laughs> and keep your sense of humor, especially you women. Okay, the world that you are inheriting is much harsher than the world we inherited. Systems are collapsed. Too many people are carrying weapons who shouldn't. Poverty is pandemic. Wage gap is worldwide. Education standards and practices have gone way down, except at BU. <laughs> Climate change is destroying the earth. Diseases need cures and the healthcare systems are expensive and need fixing. You will need to be part of that solution, and that's a tall order. You will be creating content, though, and the future is all about content. There is a need greater than ever before because there are more delivery systems than ever before, and this is why you attended Calm. Lots of people will watch this content and read it and be affected by it, so you have a responsibility to transform the world and hopefully improve the world. In the years past, in the 90s and before, we had gatekeepers, right? We had the networks, we had the newspapers, and we had the studios. Now we have the, the, the internet with multiple digital cameras, multiple digital channels, and Twitter. On one hand, it's good because there is a democratization of content. But on the other hand, there is little regulation for the truth and no quality control. There is no responsibility for wrong facts, for piracy, and this is dangerous. Data collection allows content to target their audience, and this means that people will never hear the other side. They will never be challenged. They will never have investigative reporting or anything novel that makes their minds grow. Friction is good. Infinite volume without friction prevents artists from taking risks, and we want you to take risks. Therefore, power and responsibility must go hand in hand. This is the message. Your challenge in creating content is to tell the truth. Be original. Be creative. Make your work resonate through the, through the ages. I looked up the word resonate. Here's what it is. Quote, to produce or be filled with a deep reverberating sound. So let your work evoke emotion. Let it stay the test of time. Let it be about something. Every time you produce your work, let it resonate. Every time you create content, please, do not do it for money or because your agent told you to do it or your editor talked you into it. Do choose themes that produce or are filled with a deep reverberating sound. Reveal a wrong and suggest a right to fix it. There are many, many ways to sneak truthful messages into a comedy, into a news article, or into a YouTube video. In fact, under the guise of 
uh, sorry, under the guise of entertainment, you can say much more and be heard. The X-Men movies were about tolerance. Pretty in Pink was about embracing one's uniqueness. Free Willy was about allowing animals and mammals to be enjoyed in the wild, not in captivity. So, you could be the, the voice for those who have none. You can change people's minds. You can better the world through story and fact. Do not go forward with your degree and make pablum, or I'll come back and haunt you. <laughs> for today's world, please, make sure you tell stories that uplift others. These are really tough times, and we need hope. Even bleak, starkly realistic documentaries need moments of light. Make your audience think. Make them want to build on the stories that you tell. Surprise them by writing about the world you want to see, even if that world seems like an impossible dream. Art has a way of confounding reality. Listen, unemployment was high when we made Mr. Mom in 1983. After that movie, men who stayed home were accepted, and women who were moms felt very appreciated. The world needs to hear your young and diverse voices. Calm has given you the tools to make that possible. You have more production power on your mobile phone than studios did once upon a time. I cannot wait to see what you'll create. I am energized when I see how your generation so passionately rejects sexism, racism, homophobia, and xenophobia while embracing ideals that both enrich the planet and our better selves. The next chapters in your lives will be in very turbulent times. There will be political upheaval, possibly war, and there will certainly be even more social discord. Out of all of that conflict will come exceptional, important art and content. It is incumbent on you to tell divisive stories, like the reporters who covered Watergate, or to write groundbreaking shows like Seinfeld. Do not fear failure. Let failure be your fuel. You are the new storytellers of our generation. I have faith in you. I can see it in your faces. Have faith in yourselves. Once you navigate your world, do what you love to do, love what you do, and through your work, throw some of that love back to the audience. Make a difference, and you will have used your calm degree well. Thanks to all of you for reminding me why I did what I did, and for stepping up to create what comes next. And special thanks to Boston University for steering me towards this remarkable journey. It has been a blast.